talk about um, some of the percutaneous techniques, the minimally invasive surgery, and then we'll ask some questions as we kind of get going with this. Everyone see my screen okay? We can. All right, great. So just a quick little background here. So I started doing MIS back in 2017 when we got the birds to do this from Europe. Uh, you know, I've been teaching across the country and it's been pretty exciting kind of time to be an MIS just because it's, you know, it's blossomed over the past kind of five, six years. And, you know, you know, all good or, you know, a lot comes through, right, industry and a lot quickly goes away. But I think really MIS is here to stay. Uh, you know, you really see it in a lot of the fellows who are, who are going through, you know, they really want to learn MIS because I think we all kind of see it's the future. But you know, I think this is the way foot and ankle surgery is uh, going. You know, all my mentors when I was going through training couldn't wait to stop doing M or stop doing forefoot surgery because there's a big cosmetic side to it. It's super painful. Uh, but again, it kind of MIS is really, you know, made forefoot great again. And then, you know, again, we can extrapolate this elsewhere. Uh, I, my, the distributor I tend to work with, they like to joke that I'm the, the CMO of the distributorship because they send me all their new reps to, to train with me. So, you know, I work with a ton of reps. I, like I said, I go around teaching this and this is some kind of near and dear for me. So we're going to focus on really what's the, you know, fourth generation MIS technique. And, you know, you might, you might start to hear more of this, but this is the PETA or MITA technique. And this is really just, you know, evolving from our third generation technique, which was a Chevron osteotomy of the first metatarsal distally with an Aiken osteotomy of the hallux proximal phalanx. Now we're doing a transverse osteotomy, the majority of us uh, for the distal first metatarsal osteotomy, and then still doing obviously an ache in with that. It, there's no difference, PETA or META, right? It's percutaneous or minimally invasive. We're really referring to the same thing, but this is kind of keyhole surgery or, you know, a couple millimeter incisions. Hey, Oliver, um, my, uh, yeah. oh, can, uh, maybe you'll get into this a little bit, but just maybe just some background to, too, in terms of the um, why it was in Europe and, and why it maybe didn't catch on as much in the United States. I think that's kind of an interesting, interesting story. Cause when we, I came through training, it was a big, big no, no. Yeah. So some, of you know, some of the papers back in the uh, early two thousands, uh, the, really the biggest problems early on were number one, uh, you know, non-union, right. And that's really secondary to the bird generating a lot of heat. Right, these were one to one burrs uh, or reducer, right? No, no reducer on it. So, what that means is the speed was equivalent to the torque, which is the force. Uh, you know, now we've got a four and one reducer, so the torque is four times the speed. Uh, so, again, you can run at lower speeds, so they tend to generate less heat. And then the other huge problem was the fixation, right? So, there was a lot of techniques which really involved K wire fixation. Um, and again, they had high recurrence rates. Really, you just didn't pan out when kind of the Americans tried to try to use them over here in the U.S. Uh, I think what really differentiates this technique, you know, is the fixation uh, and and again the way the screws are placed, which we'll talk about today. Uh, but then also, like I said, the way we use the burr, I think we've got a better understanding. We've got a four and one reducer, you know, and I'll go through other kind of techniques that help to cool the burr because really you know, non-union and then recurrence, you know, uh, they're really very low with this technique. So I'm currently doing, uh, you know, what's new in Halix Valgus uh, for AOFAS. And it's really looking at the literature over the past year. You know, the vast majority of Halix Valgus literature is is on third generation uh, uh, techniques or, or MICA or PICA techniques. Uh, for Halix Valgus. And then now we're starting to see some papers on fourth generation technique, but, you know, it's not, it's not just mild or moderate bunions. It's now moderate to severe. So, it, you know, everything is kind of growing around this and supporting it, you know, whereas before our prior papers showed, like I said, higher risk of non-union and high, high risk of loss of correction and recurrence. All right. So I'll get into introduction now. So we'll go through YMIS indications, we'll go through the technique, and then we'll quickly talk about challenges and go through some pearls. Uh, so, you know, again, this is this is what it looks like, right? I mean, very small incisions. These patients absolutely have a faster recovery. I was telling Nick, these really feel like kind of brochure procedures coming in, which are basically very reliable procedures, you know, very predictable pain, right? And, and these people have definitely less pain. I mean, they don't come in saying this is as bad as a knee replacement. They don't come in saying this is 
as bad as a C-section, even though, again, not now most people get epidurals, so that's probably doesn't count anymore. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the reality is these patients take only two to three narcotic tablets on average. They may have 24 hours where they may take them. Uh, it's just a very different procedure. And because you're not typically violating the first MTP joint, they tend to have less stiffness. Obviously, because of the smaller incisions, there's a lower wound complication rate, and it, it, it certainly looks prettier from a you know skin cosmetic standpoint. This is when I knew, uh, this was kind of early on in my MX experience here, but this is when I knew there was definitely something different to this. So this is a large military gentleman. He came in two weeks out from surgery in a regular sneaker, had his dressing completely off, and you can see he actually looked pretty good. I always tell my patients these are going to swell for six months after surgery. That's any foot and ankle surgery I tell patients because that way they don't ask you at three months why they can't get in their tight kind of dress shoes. Uh, but this is what he looked like, right? You can see these small little poke hole incisions. And I mean, this is a big guy. It's like a 240 pound guy, you know, strong, muscular. And, you know, he maintained his correction of the bunion, right? So that's when I knew, hey, maybe there's something different to this. The guy had taken no narcotics, and and that was actually the last time I saw him. So, hmm. uh, you know, I'm, he must have done great. But the, you know, again, I can see here this held up to a big guy who was totally non-compliant. You know, two weeks out from surgery, so that's when I knew there was kind of something different to MIS. Um, what year was that, Oliver? Just to get some frame of reference. That was probably the I don't know, maybe early 2018. Okay. Okay. Yep. Uh, so this is, you know, the technique itself involves, a, you know, it can be a transverse osteotomy at the distal first metatarsal. And we, we make this osteotomy at the base of the first metatarsal head flare. So the base of that medial eminence um, at the first metatarsal head. And, you know, again, a lot of people may still, you know, you may still hear chevron being done, right? And, and if it's a chevron, obviously, it's a more V-shaped cut as, a verse, as opposed to transverse, which is just kind of straight cut across up and down. Um, the big benefit for me, or a couple benefits, which I may talk about later as well, but of a transverse osteotomy is, number one, the, the technique when it was first described, or sorry, first kind of taught in the U.S., you know, they had you start more dorso medial. So at the junction of the top and middle third of the of the first metatarsal head from the again from a mid axial or from a medial side. And so the problem is there's a dorso medial sensory nerve that runs right very close to that area, right? So my concern is again, you're more likely to maybe irritate the nerve. And and if you've ever seen a patient with nerve pain, you know, you want to avoid that at all costs because they take like, you know, three to six months to kind of fully resolve. Um, and it ju just really can put a damper on, you know, what may otherwise be a good surgery. So again, transverse osteotomy beneficial because you can start mid axial, meaning in the middle of the, of the medial first metatarsal. It also allows for easier rotational correction, right? Because you don't, it's not a V shape, right? It's just a flat cut. So you can rot or correct the pronation deformity, which what that means is again, the, the hallux is kind of turned uh, with the nail facing the other foot a little more. Um, and then finally, the, the transverse osteotomy maintains more bone on either side of the osteotomy site. So I, I'm less worried about a screw breaking through my cortical bridge, and I'll show you that later, uh, which could lead to early loss of correction. So a long-winded way of saying, hey, this involves a tran transverse osteotomy. And that, that, that part of the procedure, you'll see different variations of this length burr, but essentially it's a two, two by 20 millimeter burr. It could be a 2.1 by 21. It could be a 2.2 by 22. That's probably just related to patents. Again, they're all the same burr, but it's a, it's about, it's a two millimeter by approximately 20 millimeter burr that we use for that osteotomy. We displace the first metatarsal head laterally toward the second metatarsal. Um, and then we fix it with two typically four millimeter screws it's fine to do a four millimeter and a three millimeter screw. That was how it was initially taught. That the problem with the three millimeter screw is that it's a very small, flimsy wire, and so it's kind of fussy to use. It can bend easily. Uh, you know, it's just much easier to use that larger kind of one four, one six wire, depending on the company, uh, in, in terms of placing two four millimeter screws. And there's really plenty of room. That one millimeter, you're not burning any significant territory. Finally, we do a percutaneous Aiken osteotomy, which is a medial closing wedge osteotomy of the proximal phalanx. And I would say with the newer jigs, which are just very powerful when you're doing this correction, you know, you really rarely have to do a soft tissue release. 
there's no harm in doing a, a lateral metatarso sesamoid ligament release, which is just, uh, you know, releasing right along the outer first metatarsal head. You're not going to put yourself at risk for hallux varus. But if you go releasing the adductor hallucis or even the lateral phalangeosesamoid ligament, you know, if you see hallux varus once, you don't want to see it again. And that can certainly put you at risk for it. So I rarely do a lateral release. Um, if you were to do one, the, the teaching is wait until after you've fixed your, you've shifted the head and fixed the osteotomy with your screws because you rely on that lateral soft tissue tension to shift the head lateral relative to the shaft. Um, but if you're just doing a metatarso sesamoid ligament release, which is really just to help improve our sesamoid rotation, it doesn't matter when you do that. That's not going to affect your, your lateral soft tissue tension. What, um, uh, what, what are you looking for in terms of um, that, that makes you think you might need to do a lateral release? So what I'm, what I'm looking for, and the, the patients I really think about this early are like a 70-year-old bunion. They're elderly patients. Those bunions are often scarred in, right? And so when I then do my osteotomy and I try and shift the head, the, the sesamoids just don't move, right? Yeah. And so I know, you know, I've got to mobilize those sesamoids so they can sit back under the head. Those are the ones where I think, hey, I've got to do some kind of release on. And honestly, those are really the only ones where I'm doing at this point. Um, I'm really trying to get all of my correction through my shift. Um, so, so that's, that's really the only situation where I'm doing it at, at this point. They're really elderly bunions. Um, now, if it was someone, say someone's in their learning curve and, you know, they just didn't quite get as much shift as they wanted, you know, there's still, there's still some, uh, some increased IM angle between the first ray and the second ray you know, that would be fine to do a lateral release on. And again, you're going to do it after you've fixed your, your distal first metatarsal osteotomy. And, that, and I typically would wait until after the Aiken because you, that, then you can kind of see your full correction. Uh, but that, that's when I would do it if, I, if a surgeon, you know, were, were considering doing it. Yeah, I think that's I a, a good point. You. I'll, Go ahead. Yeah, Oliver, you mentioned learning curve. So <clears throat> for people starting out and also people going to labs and, you know, working with reps, you know, whether cadaver labs and, and so forth, or what would you say is the learning curve? How many of these before you're like, you're, you're pretty, you know, where you're at almost your level. I mean, maybe, maybe half your level, uh, cause you've been doing, you've been doing this for a few years now, but how would you yeah, recommend? So have you that? seen how tall Oliver is? Everybody's half his level. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I, so first of all, like for a surgeon who's thinking about getting into it and you're, you know, trying to get them going, right. Uh, it usually takes it to at least one cadaver lab. And then I would always offer them to try the burr again on sawbones, like kind of the night or day before or the week of their first case. And it's, it's twofold. One is like the cadaver lab just to kind of get the technique, but also it's just a very different feel for the burr. It's different from a saw. It's telling Nick, it's, it's really a finesse move. And so you kind of, you got to let the burr do the work because if you jerk the burr, you'll burn the bone, right? Or, or, um, you might burn the, it's not only the burr, it's really even the K wires, the drill bit, everything gets irrigated when I'm doing this procedure. Uh, and that's really probably, you know, one of the biggest challenges in the early learning curve. Number two would be your wire placement. But anyway, getting back to it, when I first started doing this, like we didn't have kind of some of these set principles that we were teaching with MIS. And, and again, we'll go through some of the issues soon. Uh, but it, I think the learning curve probably now is down to probably somewhere between 10 and 20 you know, I'd say you're still you're still picking up, you know, things you'd like to do better as you get into your 20 to 50 range. But, you know, 10 to 20 is kind of probably the learning curve now, you know, with hopefully some of these principles, you know, being more commonplace and us being more aware of them. Uh, and then I think the jig also helps, you know, certainly with shifting the head adequately, but then also wire placement. Uh, and again, all the major companies on the market have a jig at this point. I'd say honestly 10 to 20 at this point. I, you know, I think we're always learning, we're always trying to do stuff better. And, you know, we learn probably most from our mistakes. So even after that 20, you know, you're still probably learning, but you know, again, I think it's a lot easier than it used to be. So in terms of indications, these are flexible bunion deformities. Um, you know, again, when I say no first TMT arthritis, it's really, you know, if there's mild arthritis at the first TMT joint, just proximal to the first MTP joint. Uh, you know, they've got to be symptomatic there for, for me to really want to do a lapidus on them. And then, you know, they shouldn't have any significant first TMT radiographic instability, right? So, 
you know, when we when we go through training, we always think about radiographic instability of the first team T joint as a cause of flat foot. And we're typically looking at the lateral view where you'll see this kind of plantar gapping at the first team T joint. Well, for MIS, it's the AP view we use. And so I, I have an x-ray later where I can show you this, but what you'll see is there's kind of medial subluxation of the base of the first metatarsal kind of hanging over the the medial portion of the medial cuneiform at the first TMT joint. Um, and those are the ones where I think, hey, you know, maybe this would be a better patient to do a, a lapidus bunionectomy on uh, because they've got underlying first TMT instability. And the reason that that's an issue, again, on the AP foot view where I'm looking at it, is that when you go to shift the head, you're, you're trying to get rid of all that redundancy in the first ray. And it's not just you know, instability at the first TMT joint. It's also even instability at the medial intercaneiform joint, you know, across what we call kind of the, the list frank articulation. You can see widening there as well, but we're kind of resetting the system when we do this. And, you know, you can only shift the head so far, you know, and still be able to sleep at night, right? So I have no problem shifting the head 100%, but I don't want to shift it like 120% necessarily, Right. So that that's kind of a big, you know, th that that would be a patient where I would still consider doing a lapidus procedure on. Obviously, absence of grade three, four, uh, first MTP joint arthritis, meaning, you know, over 50 percent joint space or, or kind of clear radiographic joint space narrowing at the first uh, MTP joint or say bone on bone. Those aren't good patients for this. But if they do have a small kind of dorsal spur and their pain is really bunion pain, right? I'm always, you know, I always ask patients multiple questions when they see me in clinic. Is this kind of, is this rubbing over shoe pain, right? You know, you, you're barefoot, you feel better. You're in sandals, you feel better. Those are the patients I'm doing this procedure on. When they tell me, hey, it's more of a deep joint pain. It gets worse the more I do on it, whether I'm barefoot or not. That's when I start thinking about, okay, maybe this is more arthritic pain and I may need to do something to also address the arthritis in this procedure. And then, you know, the, this bottom bullet point here really gets back to the, to the notion of first TMT instability, but the width of the IM space, the one, two, meaning the space between the first metatarsal shaft and the second metatarsal shaft is not, is, is not significantly greater than the width of the first metatarsal head. You can do this procedure. If it is significantly greater, then again, there's most likely first TMT instability because that's kind of the only way to get to that point. I thought that was a good point. I, I hadn't heard that one before, Oliver, that, and that's, you know, kind of a, a good um, rule to use in, in terms of having something that you can very tangibly look at and, and see. Yeah. Like I said, for us on the surgical side, the change is you're not looking at the lateral view. It's really the AP view that yeah. kind of dictates whether I'm doing MIS. And trust me, if I can, I will. Uh, you know, doing a lapidus procedure is pretty painful for me at this point. When I can do MIS, it's just such a different recovery for the patient. So in terms of the power box, you know, there's some companies have their own box where this is already kind of preset. Uh, the, the, the system I use runs off the Stryker core console, which is in every kind of, you know, surgery center or hospital you're at uh, for the most part. But again, it's a high torque, low speed reducer attachment on the on the uh, TPS handpiece. Uh, you know, I typically use the foot pedal rather than the handpiece on the on on the uh, handpiece or on the burr itself. And the reason for that is that if you use the handpiece with the striker system or REMB or TPS, um, you have to hold it kind of farther from the the tip of the burr, and so you just have less kind of uh, or less control. You the the feel is not as good. So I want to hold it down as close as I can to the burr. Um, again, I'm not holding the part that spins, but I'm holding the handpiece just off where the burr kind of uh, goes into. So again, I have better better hand control when I use a foot pedal. And that's, I think, pretty standard for most of us doing this. For a bunion, I typically do 5,000 RPMs uh, uh, for this. And again, you have to do the four-in-one reducer setting. Um, if you're using some of the other companies, Arthrex or Striker, it, it's uh, preset. You know, again, the downside is then you have to bring in capital equipment with a striker box. You know, it's there anyway, so you don't have to bring in extra capital equipment. Um, so in terms of the implant, you know, I don't care what you're using, but it needs to be a, a beveled head. Um, there's, you know, there's plenty of literature showing higher screw removal rate with non-beveled heads. If you're doing MIS, you should be using a beveled or chamfered head. Um, this is the implant I use. It's got a hemisphere of star drive so that the screwdriver, there's an etch in the screwdriver that always lines up with the bevel in the head. So, you know, once you remove your 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 driver, 
you know, you know which way you've left the chamfer, which should be flush with the medial cortex of the first metatarsal. Um, other systems, it's just a laser line. So when you pull it out, you then got to put it back in and kind of do it under flora to make sure you've left, left that bevel uh, flush with the medial cortex. And, and patients will feel the screw medially. So you really need to bury that head, right? And you shouldn't be seeing high rates of screw removal if you're burying the head appropriately. And I'll talk about what I do to kind of you know, reduce the risk of, of your soft tissue rotation. But I promise you, if a head is prominent over the medial cortex, the patient will feel it. Okay. Especially, they won't feel it for about three three months or so, but you know, by the six month range, they will. And that's because their swelling will have gone down by then. It's also good to note that these are fully threaded screws and they're, they're constant pitch. And so what that means is there's no compression through the screw. You don't need compression. You're shifting this head 80 to 100%. There's a lot of soft tissue tension in the first ray. So again, you don't need compression. These are really stability screws. Uh, and then they should all have reverse cutting threads and that makes it for easy removal. So this is my setup here. Um, you can see the whole foot and ankle are off the bed and that's super important. The, typically for a right-handed surgeon, the C-arm comes from, the, it's a mini C-arm typically we use. You can use a big C-arm if you want but most of us use a mini C-arm and it typically comes from the right side of the patient with the arm curling in. Right, and you, you want the whole foot off the bed here, and what you can't see the other leg, and that's because I have it butterflied out of the way, right? Butterfly out of the way, and this, this allows me unimpeded access of the mini C arm, you know, at the forefoot because I don't want anything blocking the C arm so I can't get the view I want. That's super important. I typically have the foot built up, um, just I just make this kind of bump with blue towels, uh, and coban that that works great, so then it's floating, and I have the bump. It, it looks like it's it, the leg is centered here um, over the bump, but actually where I have the the leg is is all the way to the medial edge of the bump. And that's so that with the hand piece, I'm not bumping into the bump as I'm using it, right? But this is super important because if your setup's not right, your surgeon's gonna struggle um, and it makes the rest of the case painful for both you and the surgeon. I don't use tourniquet. You know, I'm doing everything I can to reduce risk of of heat generation and you know I don't mind a little bit of uh, oozing blood cooling the burr um, I have no problem with that you can put them in about 10 degrees of Trendelenburg just to slow any ooze uh, but it's not necessarily totally necessary and then I can't tell you guys this enough but the little spout of irrigation that comes out of some of the hand pieces on the market is totally inadequate you know for me it's a it's a bulb syringe and I, I've got a paper I'll show it, it's coming up at some point but that we did an FAO um, that shows there's a, there is a significant difference in temperature change between room temp irrigation and chilled irrigation. So, you know, the staff know when I'm doing MIS cases to put uh, uh, saline in the fridge, right? And then we just say at the beginning of the case, can you get the refrigerated saline? So, so it's chilled saline and it's, done, and it's just co like copious irrigation with a bulb syringe. That's what I think it takes to reduce your risk of generating heat and therefore burning the skin or getting non-union, something you don't wanna see for your surgeon. That is so important. And it's not just the burr you irrigate, but it's also the drill bit and the guide wires. You're putting these in at kind of steep angles. Uh, and you know, the old patients, they, they cut like butter, the, the wires go in easily. They're actually much easier. It's the young patients, like the 20, 30 year olds, the, the adolescents, those are the ones where I tell, you know, where I tell a surgeon, hey, take your time on this you know, pause frequently, clean the burr flutes frequently, because those are the ones where they've got really good bone and they're going to generate more heat. Those are the ones that I think are at risk. Oliver, how, how often have you seen complications from the burr in terms of <clears throat> necrotic bone or non-union that you thought was because of something you just mentioned, improper cooling or speed of, of the cut? So I, I harp on this stuff because it's really a learning curve issue. I mean, I have one non-union I've revised in my hundreds of these. I have one delayed union, right? So it happens, right? But it's not common. You know, I, I do, it's very interesting. Like in this, in the area I'm in, uh, you know, I started doing MIS and it just like, it just blew up because it's a very affluent area, highly insured, great access to medicine. And so now there's like 30 surgeons in our area doing MIS because if you don't, you're losing business. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, it, you, obviously with that much MIS going on, you see, you see complications because, uh, we operate enough, we're going to see them. Uh, and so you do see it, but again, it's typically a learning curve issue, right? It's someone not following the rules. 
Um, and it's usually early on in their, you know, their first kind of 10 cases where you might see something like that. Uh, but, you know, again, the longer you go, the less you kind of see that that stuff. So it, it, that's why I'm harping on this, because it, it usually you tend to see this in the learning curve. If you if you follow the rules, MIS technique is super forgiving and your patient's going to be really happy. But thou shalt not burn the bone is a big one. <laughs> I, I think that's throughout orthopedics. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah exactly. That's exactly right. But it's super important because it's not, it's not a big surface area, obviously, and you're relying on bone remodeling in this case over about three to six months. So it's just super important here. So, you know, again, I, I have a, a PA with me at all times. I have two PAs, but, uh, you know, reality is you can, you can do this case with a surgical tech alone. And the reason for that is the whole case is set up on the Mayo. That's what I'm trying to show here. It's like a buffet, right? And this is kind of pre-jig, uh, you know, set up. You know, they've still got the flexible shifting tool up here, parallel guide if I want it. Uh, but the whole case should be set up on the Mayo ahead of time. And it's tucked in just to my right up over the patient's body. Uh, and that way I can just grab stuff as I need it, right? And the tech or, or again, your assistant can just be irrigating at the end of the bed, right? So this, it's a very easy case to do at a surgery center. You don't need a ton of hands, ton of help. And so this is just the paper we published, right? It's just showing that there's a, there is a significant difference in temperature change. This was a cadaver model, and this was for a calcaneal osteotomy, just gives a bigger osteotomy to kind of uh, exaggerate the point. Uh, but there was a significant difference in temperature change with chilled saline versus room temp. Not the best study I've ever done, but still nonetheless showed there is a difference. There's kind of limited literature on this, so we wanted to get something out there. All right, so going back now to star point. Okay, so your surgeon's in there. They're, they're fired up. The first thing I do in the procedure, right, is you can see in this in this clinical image here where I've drawn on the on the skin. I don't draw the whole metatarsal like that, but that mid-axial line is super important. And I'm looking for this good cascade view. So when I say that is this top image here, this lateral view of the foot, uh, this is the cascade view I'm looking for. I'm not looking for a, a complete overlay view where all the metatarsals are in line with each other, but this is the view I want. This we call it kind of like a cascade view. Um, and then I'm, I've got a metal wire on the skin there, and I just mark it with a, with a marking pen, right? And I use that later to align my jig to, to align the arm of the jig to. That's where I'm going to put my screws in along that line, that mid-axial line. So that's super important, and that's really the only thing I mark on the skin ahead of my procedure. So then you can see here on this, this uh, lower AP view image, looking top down at the foot, I'm about to make my skin incision, and that's at that medial base of the first metatarsal head flare. It's a four millimeter incision, maybe. Um, and that's where we're going to do our distal first metatarsal osteotomy. Again, the initial teaching was at the junction of the dorsal middle third. I now go mid-axial to avoid the nerve because I'm doing a transverse, just flat cut osteotomy right across. So I make that incision. I will typically do the medial eminence resection up front for two reasons. One is that medial eminence there is the most prominent at this point. And it's obviously super stable because we haven't done a bone cut yet. Um, truth be told, right? Like if it's, if it's not super hypertrophic, meaning not super enlarged, you may not even need to do it as part of the procedure. But I typically do do it because it creates a nice pocket for me to place the paddle of the jig later on in the procedure. This is done with a three millimeter wedge burr. And you know what you can't appreciate from this, but you can see it in that top right image maybe is I'm using this kind of overhand grip right here. Um, and and the, the burr, in order to get this angle, your hand piece is sitting on top of the first metatarsal, you know, almost angling medial away from the foot to get that angle. So just so you know, your, your fingers are on top of the, the hand piece there. Otherwise, if you've got your whole kind of hand around it, you know, it's not going to be able to sit in the right position. And I'm angling from, from kind of dorsal to plantar. I sweep plantar, and then I kind of saw upward all the way up, all the way up. And then I drop my hand and the handpiece below the first metatarsal to just get that dorsal medial lip. That's the technique for getting the medial eminence out. It's totally fine if your surgeon wants to wait until after you've fixed the osteotomy and taken the medial spike off, right? Or maybe they don't want to do it at all. But if it's hypertrophic, I recommend doing it kind of up front at the beginning of the procedure. And again, this is with the three millimeter wedge burr that we, we do this with. And, and the other big question I get is, is this an outside in? Kind of like you're going from the outside burring in. This is really an inside out. So I'm burring right into the eminence and then sweeping uh, up and down to, to clear it. 
So how many birds do you have open on the table for a standard bunion? It's always three birds. It's always three the birds. wedge burr. Yep, the two by 20 burr, which we do for the distal osteotomy and to remove the distal first metarsal medial spike. And then the two by 12 burr for the ache and osteotomy. I used to kind of, you know, I'm in a surgery center, so I used to kind of be cheap and just try and do it with two birds. But the reality is, you know, the burrs dull, right? They don't, they don't last forever. These are one-time use burrs, right? So you should really use three burrs. Um, that'll give you the best cut. <laughs> and again, a dull bur is going to generate more heat. Uh, so I, I'd always recommend using three birds. If it's someone who's got super good bone, hey, maybe, you know, you could open a, a fourth, you know, two by 20 burr um, if you really need it. But, uh, you know, again, the typical is three birds. Anything different that should be had, you know, in your back pocket that that for any issues that would come up with the the osteotomy, any different sizes or generally speaking, if you have those three, you're in pretty good shape. Yeah, generally speaking, you have those three, you're in great shape. The, there's a two by eight burr that I use for hammer toes, lesser toe corrections. Uh, there's a, you know, what's really important for calcaneal osteotomies. Um, you know, Novastep has a 10 centimeter, three by 30 cutting burr. You really want a long burr for the calc um, yeah. in bigger, bigger adult male patients. They've got really wide calcaneus and you're just hubbing it with a with standard most companies, it's a seven centimeter burr, three by 20 burr. And so it's 20 millimeters of cutting surface. You end up like having to choke the burr out just to get enough length to complete the osteotomy. So there, you know, the, the burr does kind of matter. But again, no, those those are the three standard burrs. You shouldn't need to have anything else for your for, your, for this procedure. Yeah. Not even like in a worst case scenario, that's everything you need. So, you know, when I'm teaching this, um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll typically do the dorsal osteotomy first. So the dorsal portion, portion of it. And we do that. This is an underhand grip, and we're let the burrs kind of dropping down. It's a, you know, the key to tell the surgeon is that you're rotating. The center of your rotation is at the the skin incision, so you're, it's a rotational maneuver. And so when I'm teaching this to a surgeon, I always tell him like with, with a sawbone, right? Because sawbone, you can see your cut more easily because there's no soft tissue, right? That you want to do your osteotomy without making an X in the bone. So as you're doing your dorsal osteotomy, what surgeons inevitably do is they start cutting into the plantar limb of the osteotomy, right? And so for a transverse osteotomy, that's not that big a deal. For a chevron osteotomy, it would be because of the V cut. Uh, but the reality is you can't just do that on a live person because there's soft tissue there, right? Uh, so again, it's a rotational maneuver. And the key that I tell people is keep the pressure at the distal tip of the burr. That ought to keep it typically centered within your skin incision. Uh, and again, your, your hand is dropping down. Make sure they don't have the C-arm in the way as you do this. And it, this is so important too. So it's extremely hard to cut soft tissue with a burr uh, because it's low speed, uh, high torque, right? Now, again, that's if, if something's not under tension. So when I'm doing the dorsal limb, I have the surgeon extend or dorsiflex the hallux, bring it upward to take tension off of the EHL the extensor elusus longus tendon, so they don't injure it. And I'm also listening for the pitch change. So, you know, I know the burr is finished cutting because the pitch changes, right? You don't hear that same kind of cutting cutting pitch that you normally hear. Um, that's how you know you're done. So those are two things you can do. And inevitably, I think the, the area of the bone that the surgeons forget to or don't fully complete is the very dorsomedial cortex and then the very plantar medial cortex. You run it again until you, until you hear that pitch change and then you're done. And as I'm running the burr, I pause every couple seconds. And if I if it feels like the burr is not advancing, then it might be a patient with really good bone and you need to pull the burr out, clean the flutes, and, and then you kind of put it back in and keep going. That That's, is super important because, if it, yeah, if the burr gets caught up with uh, bone debris, right, then it'll start to get hot quicker. Uh, you know, again, we're trying to avoid that. Yeah, and I think... I think the point being is that there's a lot of things that you can pick up when you're with a surgeon in the case and you really have to, it's easy at this point, I think, to get, to just kind of be waiting or, you know, chatting with whatever in the background, but like listening to those little cues, Hey, maybe that, that bird doesn't sound like it's cutting. Do you want to make sure the flutes are clean? Like things like that can be super duper helpful. Cause when just speaking from experience, when you get into it, you kind of lose track when you haven't done a lot of these that you, you start to forget, oh, wait, I need, maybe need to clean these, clean these flutes out. So I think it, it helps to have somebody that, that hears that difference is kind of paying attention to it as the case is going on. Yeah. And, and admittedly so, right. As a rep, you may be a couple feet back. And if you're in the OR with me, I'm bumping EDM for the entire procedure. So 
you may not hear that pitch change, but you know, if it's a silent room, you can definitely hear it and you should listen <laughs> for it just so you get an idea. Yeah. All right. So, so we've done our dorsal limb. We've dorsal flexed the hallux while we're doing that. So then the same thing now goes for the plantar limb, right? The bottom limb. So now I'm going to bend the hallux downward uh, in order to take tension off the flexor lucis brevis and the flexor lucis longus on the bottom of the foot. Yeah. The other key is I tell, you know, I tell surgeons just gently oscillate in and out as you're doing this osteotomy to feel that far cortex and making sure you're getting through it, not leaving a little cortical lip, you know, that could hold you up once you're done. So this is, I, I think, super important. In, in orthopedics, we're always worried about, you know, not shortening the first ray. Like when you do a lapidus, you got to shorten it by, you know, three to four millimeters because you're, you're burning the first TNT joint. You know, in, in, and the problem with shortening the first ray, why do we even say that, right, is that you get more weight transfer from the first ray to the second. And so then people develop what's called second transfer metatarsalgia, meaning pain under the second metatarsal head. Right. And so we don't want that. And now we know this is a two millimeter burr we're using. So there's a two millimeter curve, meaning just by doing our bone cut with the burr, we're shortening the first ray by two millimeters. So we got to make up for that. But, you know, it's a balance, right? Because the problem is if you over tension the first ray, meaning you angle too distal, then two things are going to happen, right? The, the, when the more distal you angle, the more the head is going to lengthen or, or more the first ray is going to lengthen as you shift the head to correct the bunion. And the problem is, right, the soft tissue can only go so far. So now if you angle too distal, you're going to over tension the first ray. It's going to two, two problems can happen from that, right? Number one, it could be really hard to shift the head because there's just too much tension there. Number two, you know, if you over tension the first ray, that stress has got to go somewhere right? And with this procedure, with any distal osteotomy procedure, the stress is going to concentrate at the first TMT joint. And there's another biomechanical paper we've done to, to show that. Uh, whereas if you do like, say, a lapidus where you fuse the first TMT joint, it's going to concentrate at the first MTP joint. So there's a risk of developing arthritis and as a result. Um, so anyway, the, if you over tension the first ray, this patient in the post-op, it could develop then first TMT joint instability leading to then recurrence of the bunion, right? So again, I'm, I'm just trying to say it's a balance. And so what do I tell people, right? Uh, you know, what do we tell the surgeon as a guide for how, how far should I angle the bird distal, right? I use the second metatarsal shaft because ultimately that's what we're, you know, that's what we're trying to align the first ray relative to. And I angle about five to 10 degrees distal to the perpendicular of the second metatarsal shaft. That's my guide. And so I'm showing here in this image this would be over angling distal, right? This would be way too much. All right. So again, I'm using the, uh, if I could draw a line perpendicular shaft, that's what it would look like. And you can see here, I'm just showing, right? It's going to train, it's going to just vastly lengthen the first rate. That's going to be a problem. They're going to have trouble shifting the head. You know, this would be probably more in line with what I want to do, right? About 10 degrees uh, distal to the perpendicular of the shaft of the second metatarsal. So I always have you know, I tell the rep when they're with me, they have two rule, two jobs, right? One is CR maintenance, right? Making sure it's where I want. They need to adjust the image so it looks like this, the AP view, so the metatarsals are straight up and down. And then they need to open me the freaking implants, right? Other than that, I should be okay. Uh, and, and so it's really important that they get this kind of up and down so I can make sure I'm angling the burr appropriately. And so you see this is going to, you know, maintain length in the first ray without over tensioning. So it's a balance. But again, so Oliver, make that clear. Yep. Oliver, for people, especially just starting out, you know, many times when we're doing osteotomies, other places in the body, we're putting maybe a K wire or something and cutting along a K wire. Uh, what do you kind of recommend here? So, you know, are you doing this under floral, like in getting multiple shots and recommending sure. that? Uh, or, I mean, can you kind of let yeah, us so, know how do that? Totally. So, I mean, the nice thing is, right, you can, you can go through the, the initial cortex, that medial cortex. And you still have total freedom to change the, the trajectory of the burr, right? Until you go through the far cortex. And even if you went through the far cortex, you could just pull it back and make a new kind of apex for your osteotomy, right? So you really have a ton of freedom. And, and so I'm, what I'm doing is I'm looking at an AP view, getting my hand set. I go through the initial cortex to the far cortex. I check again. And then I go through the far cortex, right? That's, that's what I'm doing. I'm not putting a K wire in. Um, the, the other thing I didn't mention is that I always am also angling 10 degrees plantar because if anything, 
we would want the head to shift or translate slightly plantar relative to the shaft. We wouldn't want it to go dorsal to the shaft because again, that could increase risk of transfer metatarsalgia. And that would be in the event we didn't do quite like a perfect transverse osteotomy. Maybe it ended up being more like a chevron. So that was the, that'd be the one other point to make. But again, I'm going through one cortex. I'm taking another shot. And if I like my trajectory still, then I go through the other cortex. So I'm doing this all in AP view. I'm not flipping to a lateral. Really, it's the AP view I'm using as a guide here. Great. Thank you. All right. And so this is what I'm showing here. You can see this patient admittedly maybe had like a millimeter of first CMT subluxation, you know, but not enough that I thought, hey, I, I have to do a lapidus. You can see maybe there's some medial intercaneiform widening there as well. But you can see here in this patient, the post-op, now there's maybe three millimeters of medial subluxation at the first TNT joint. And, you know, again, this was a, this is a moderate, you know, bunion at least here. Uh, you know, admittedly, so though this patient still is super happy with, with her foot and had her other foot done. So, but I'm just showing this to show the point of this is what first TNT instability would look like and what can happen with a bigger bunion if you shift it, you know, enough. And this can happen anyway, right? We know the, the, the stresses are going to be concentrated at the first TMT joint with this technique. Uh, but I just want to show that for the reps so they understand what I'm talking about. In terms of, so it sounds like you don't haven't completely gotten rid of, you know, doing lapidus. It sounds like most of what you do is MIS, but, but still using lapidus in, in different, um, some of the different corrections. Is that correct? Uh, it it's like a really bad day for me if I have to do a lapidus <laughs> at this point. I mean, I can't even like I can count on my hand the number of lapidus I did last year. Now, again, there's nothing that no anyone who says, "Oh, this is 100% of the time what you should do, you should run from." Right? That's not what I'm trying to tell you. I just like it. It is such a different procedure. This this meta or pizza technique over doing a lapidus bunionectomy for the patient for the recovery in terms of pain. You know, it, it it really is hard for me to want to do a lapidus on a patient, just because so, re re realistically, like these patients come in, they just want the bump gone, right? Like that's all they care about, right? They just want to be able to fit in like a reasonable shoe, for the most part, right? There's obviously patients who come in and you know they want more, but it, it you know they don't want to go through a huge elaborate recovery. Uh, so so for me, they they typically have first TMT arthritis, like where it's symptomatic, then I got to do it. A flat foot alone is not reason enough for me to do a lapidus over this technique. Um, reason being, right, just because I fused their first TMT joint doesn't mean their their flat foot's just going to go away. Their posterior tip tendon is still dysfunctional. They still have hindfoot valgus, right? You know, we're not doing a complete flat foot correction for them. So I, I don't necessarily buy that I have to do, you know, a lapidus and a flat foot uh, or, or kind of, you know, more significant. Like if they came in and the pre-op looked like this image uh, on the left, then I would say, well, I should probably do a lapidus on this patient, right? Because there's clear first TMT instability there. You know, I'm going to lose some of my IM correction from that. So I got a question, Oliver, <clears throat> maybe not your own or maybe some of your own too, uh, if they've had a recurrence. What do you do if you have to, re this is a question that uh, someone asked, what do you do if you have to revise this? Um, so for, so perhaps yeah, I mean, recurrence or not big enough shift? Yeah, so, well, not big enough shift. Um, you could revise this, the same technique. Now, the, the challenge there is that now that osteotomy site is going to be much more sclerotic, meaning harder bone. So you really need to take your time if you're going to osteotomize through that. Uh, also, like, and you can see here in this left image, you look at all that remodeled bone across where, where the head was shifted. I mean, this is what they look like. It's super cool. When we first started doing this technique, everyone thought, does that really heal? And I'll show a great image later to really emphasize that point. Uh, but anyway, going back to this, so if, if your surgeon is going to revise an M this technique with, with the same technique, you just need to even go slower when you're re-osteotomizing the distal, uh, distal first metatarsal. Um, you can revise this with a lapidus. You can revise this with a first MTP fusion. I think they're all reasonable. It would just depend on the reason you're doing it, you know, how stiff they were. Uh, but again, any of those work and vice versa, right? I can't tell you how many lapidus patients I've revised with this technique. They do great. They do absolutely great. I have to go in, I have to take out the first TNT hardware, but revising lapidus with this technique is, is easier than revising this technique, uh, with, with the same technique. So I would tell the reps, you know, it's a great, that's a great, uh, great indication for doing this technique.
All right. So Chevron or transverse osteotomy, I, mean, I certainly talked about this earlier. There's really honestly limited literature on this. This is just showing a biomechanical paper uh, that just really kind of missed the mark in terms of trying to show the difference. The screw placement was not adequate. You can see on the right side here, the left side is a kind of better screw placement. You can see they're, they're bicortical with their proximal screw, meaning it goes in the medial first metatarsal cortex, out the distal lateral first metatarsal cortex before it enters the first metatarsal head. On the right side, this is not what your screws should look like. They're both going through the osteotomy site. They're both unicortical. They're not catching that far medial cortex. That's inadequate. This is a biomechanical study looking at failure. So, you know, you're not really testing apples to apples here. This, this just didn't really answer the question. So the point is jury's still out. But what I can tell you is most of us have gone to doing transverse. This is just trying to emphasize the point that there's there's more bone on either side of the first metatar or on either side of the osteotomy if you do a transverse osteotomy versus chevron. So the top image is showing a chevron. The bottom is showing a transverse osteotomy. And the problem is you could think you have great first metatarsal head purchase on the AP view, right? But if you're in the center of the apex of your osteotomy, meaning as which is these screws are showing, you obviously have less thread purchase uh, in that osteotomy or in the head, number one. But also number two, it's just a triangle of bone on the metatarsal shaft side. So again, th there's a higher risk of screw breakout, I think, with, with doing a chevron osteotomy over transverse. And I'm trying to show here, this is what it would look like on the shaft side, right? It's just a triangle. Uh, so there's less bone preventing kind of screw cutout or screw breakage leading to loss of correction. All right, so now we do our osteotomy. Once it's complete, um, what I'll do is I'll put a, and to tell for the surgeon's sake, usually you'll feel this kind of slight give once the osteotomy is complete. Not 100% of the time, but probably 90% of the time you will. That's how you know. Um, when surgeons first start doing this, you know, their tendency is to not totally complete the cut. Like I said, they leave that dorsomedial or plantar medial bone. Um, you want to make sure they totally complete the cut. And a quick test to, to see did they complete is, just tell them to distract or basically pull traction on the hallux, the toe, right? And if you see the osteotomy site widen right on fluoro, then you know you completed the cut. You'll see it kind of accordion open right back and forth. That's a good test. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll put in, so, you know, when they started teaching this technique, they said you got to run an elevator or a periosteal elevator above and below or really above the osteotomy. You don't do it below. Or, or on the bottom part of the head, just to you know, risk it for because of risk of injury in the blood supply. You don't need to do any of that crap. I don't do any sort of freer elevation. I just put this cobra tool in once my osteotomy is done, distract the osteotomy to release any periosteum, and now I'm off to the races. And you can see here, this is pre-jig, but you know, for surgeons who are who are not using a jig or want to start without the jig before using a jig. I would always have them get their wires pre-set up, right? And this is my proximal wire. This is the most important wire. Um, and you see, I've put it out. My it, It's all the way up through the far cortex here. And so I'm ready after this to shift the head and just advance that wire in into the first metatarsal. So my wires are teed up, you know, before I do my shift, right? And what I would used to do when I was kind of getting a feel for this is I would, I would do the osteotomy uh, then put the wire, you know, shift the head, see where I kind of wanted my wires to be. Then I would place the wires, you know, reshift the head and advance them into the head. But just so you know, that's a really good technique. The surgeon shouldn't be trying to hold his shift while he's trying to place the wires at the same time. He should just be advancing them into the head. So here we shifted the head lateral relative to the shaft. We're locking out the first TMT joint in Barris, and I've got you know my wire teed up here. This is a flexible shifting tool. You know, it's a, we made a larger one because it would give you more power with more shift. You can put anything down the shaft to shift the head. You can put a freer, you can put a hemostat. Um, but again, this is the flexible shifting tool that comes in the system I use. Now I just use the jig. Um, and this this really highlights kind of like this would be totally ideal placement. So number one, our proximal wire and therefore our proximal screw enters the base of the first metatarsal. So a lot of surgeons, when they're in their learning curve, they kind of default to placing their screws more distal because it's easier. It's harder to get this trajectory down low uh, because of the soft tissue along the medial foot, the medial malleolus. You know, but again, I kind of bend the wire in with... Uh, you know, with repetition, this becomes very straightforward to do, but this allows you to get much more purchase because of the better angle, the steeper angle, 
in the first metatarsal head and you can see that distally. This wire should be exiting the lateral cortex about a centimeter from the osteotomy site or so, right? Now, obviously this is kind of a gross estimate, right? You can't measure this on fluoro, but point being, there should be a good cortical bridge between that wire and your osteotomy site. That's what prevents early breakout or fracture through that, through that cortical bridge. That's what allows you to weight bear these patient, patients immediately after surgery. And then yes. my second wire. Or That's sorry, so important me. that uh, I, see, I see quite a few x-rays where it, it doesn't quite reach that. And um, yeah, and I'll I don't show, think that I'll can show be what that failure. Yeah, I'll show what that failure looks like. But this is so important. This yeah. is really so important. And again, that wasn't like, you know, when I started doing this. It was kind of the Wild West and we weren't we didn't really know that. But this is so clear to us at this yeah. point. You can see that on my lateral view, right? Like this is just money, right? I mean, I'm, I'm up high, down low, high five in my system when I got it like this, but you know, I, I'm even, I'm kind of parallel on the AP plane and even divergent on the lateral plane here. You can see there's slight plantar translation by maybe a millimeter, that's totally fine. That's gonna maintain weight on the first ray, but you don't wanna see it plantar flexed or dorsiflex, meaning there's like a, a bent angulation at the osteotomy site. A little translation, translation plantarly is fine, but not angulation, all right? So again, to be clear, your wires don't have to be divergent on both planes. That's just extra style points. But what is a must is that, again, your wire, should, your proximal wire, which is the most important wire, your second wire is really more of just for torsional control, meaning to prevent rotation of the head, um, and that one will I will either straddle the osteotomy like it is here. See, see how it's just unicortical here. On bigger shifts, you can even go bicortical on that one as well. Um, but again, your proximal wire with this green circle should be entering the first metatarsal at the base and then exiting the lateral cortex about eight to 10 millimeters from the osteotomy site. And the so, other, one other thing okay, uh, that I've, not, I've heard people talk about is putting Coban on the ankle. I don't know if you do that or not, but that wire gets pretty close to the, to the medial mal sometimes. Do you so do that? yeah, two things to talk about that. Uh, number one, I always say irrigate the wires because you can, you know, that wire can get hot and young bone, right? So again, my assistant's irrigating that, that proximal wire so it doesn't burn the skin, number one. Um, where people tend to beat up the medial, medial malleolus is actually typically with the grip blasted uh, quick connect attachment to the drill. And that's typically when you're firing your screw in on power uh, or it depends on the system, you know, if you're drilling, they, maybe it's a quick connect, but that grip blasted surface will, will abrade or abrade the, the medial malleolus. And so what people will do, you know, again, it, it, the way you avoid this is you abduct the foot, meaning push it away from the body. So I drop the foot downward right so that i've got plenty of room with my with my drill bit or with my you know uh uh with the quick connect on right so i don't you know uh braid the skin there um but again if you're in your your learning curve the easiest thing to do is probably put a tegaderm there because it's, it's not very thick um you can definitely do coban though as well it's a good thing if someone's doing it for the first time just because like that is the last thing a surgeon is thinking about when they're doing their first MIS case. Yeah, I think definitely that having that perspective as the as you know being kind of in the back of the room, you can take a step back, you can see what's going on, and you can see something like that, and that is super helpful information to point out. Hey, you're good. It looks like it's going to braid the skin, and I think that's completely appropriate in, in any case to call that out. All right, and then this image is just kind of emphasizing the point of, you know, screw placement where you might see earlier on a learning curve. And then on the right side, you can see this is really ideal screw placement. You can see it's a big difference in, in you know, where they are. And, and again, the, the angle that you're getting, how far I am from the osteotomy site. And so, again, why does that matter? Well, this is what you can see, right? If you look at the right image, you think, well, that doesn't look so bad. That lateral view, everything looks pretty well aligned. Uh, but you look at this left image and this patient's lost correction here. They they fractured out through that cortical bridge and they, they obviously it looks like an insight to osteotomy here, meaning, you know, we cut the bone and didn't shift the head. And so if you see this surgeon says, oh my God, you know, I did my first MIS case and, you know, this happened, like, what do I do? Uh, well, it all depends, right? I mean, you can either just, it, it depends. I think you have to take the screw out in this case. So you've got to take out this this very prominent distal screw, number one. And it's a discussion with the patient, right? I say, 
you know, if the alignment were to look good, you know, I would say, hey, we can leave it and let it be. But if the alignment looks way off and, and look, they say, hey, I want you to fix this. Well, then you go in and you revise it, right? You, you have to get new screw insertion sites, um, which is definitely doable. Uh, you, you can place a dorsal to plantar screw, although you won't get quite as much purchase. Um, but again, it's a patient discussion. Uh, you know, and, and again, this is, uh, this is something you don't see typically outside of a, outside of a learning curve. This would be typically a learning curve thing. And, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, if you look at the literature, it's definitely described in the papers that are out there. It's not a high recurrence or sorry, not a high occurrence, typically under two to 3%. Um, but, uh, you know, this is why the, that wire placement, you know, matters why you want that good cortical bridge, because this, this will prevent the, that or what you see here. So in terms of the translation maneuver, um, you know, this is done after we've got our guide wires placed. We pull traction on the hallux. We supinate to correct the pronation deformity. Um, and then I've, you know, with my, with a right foot, I've got my thumb. So I'm, I'm compressing the shifting tool up against the hallux. I'm pulling the hallux in the varus to shift the head. I'm using that lateral soft tissue tension. And I've got my thumb under the head to maintain the sagittal alignment of the head, meaning I don't want it to, to drift too far plantar or too dorsal. It, on a left foot, I'm using my index finger under the head to maintain that sagittal alignment. Again, this is with a transverse osteotomy. With a chevron osteotomy, there may be some more intrinsic stability to it, but the reality is when you're shifting the head 80 to 90%, there's not a whole lot that a chevron gives you in terms of stability osteotomy. So this is just showing the, the jig I use here. They're all fairly similar. <laughs> and um, you can see I'm compressing uh, the, the hand piece here up against the hallux to shift it. I'm, I'm also, I've got my index finger under the hallux there to, to derotate it, to supinate the head. Uh, and, then I'm, and then once I'm, this is me just putting it on here and checking it, but I would slide my thumb underneath uh, in order to maintain the sagittal alignment of that the first metatarsal head. This middle image compared to the right image, I'm just trying to show you, you wanna have the paddle there sitting right down on the osteotomy site if possible. And so then we've placed our wires. You can see this is that ideal placement. Um, with, this, with this jig, just so you know, sometimes the distal wire will deflect off that spike within the shaft. You know, that spike's gotta be long enough that you don't wanna fracture out the medial cortex because these are really powerful, these jigs. Uh, but it, it's usually not so deflected. It's a, you have to re re uh, aim it or you know redo it or re angle it. I should say once you're done, uh, you know it's very easy to re angle it if you have to. You just take the old jig off and you just realign or you know put that distal wire where you want. As long as your proximal wire is good though, it's no issue to re re angle your your distal wire. Another thing I'll see too is, you know, you take the jig off, which is super powerful, um, and you'll see the wires kind of bend backward along with the head, right? And, and certain lawyers say, oh my, like, why are your wire and wires bending? You know, now I'm losing correction. Like, is that a problem? Well, as soon as you put in your proximal screw, it's going to kick the head back over and straighten out that wire for you. So you don't have to like, it's not a problem when you see that. Again, you don't see it here yet because I haven't taken the jig off, but you know, you will have, a, I have heard surgeons ask about that. You know, is that normal? Is that a problem? Do I need to redo it? Why are the wires bending? Well, it's, it's okay. Just put in your proximal screw first. It'll kick the head back over and straighten the wire out for you. That's a really important point. I think, I think, uh, uh, you know, that, 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 that's going to freak somebody out the first time that happens. And I think just being able to reassure them that, Hey, once you put the screw in, it should be fine. I think that that'll be really helpful. And, and so then what you'll see too, so say I re-angled, I, you know, I didn't like my distal wire. I pulled it back and re-angled it after I took the jig off. Well, you know, that'll look then straight. Your, your proximal wire will look bent slightly back, you know, back medial. And then what you do is you put in your proximal screw. It'll then kick over that that distal wire will then bend over toward the other one and that's and then again you can just pull it back and, and run it back straight in the head but that's not an issue but just so you know you may see that vice versa i'm not sure if i said that as clearly I, as i could but you got to see it to believe it that's all i can say i i got a question for you oliver and it was mentioned in the chat uh someone messaged me um what if you fracture the you know i actually fracture of the medial cortex like where, where the screw enters yep. What's yep. your bailout or what, what have you done? Because I mean, I mean, that can happen 
anywhere, right? I mean, any, anywhere where we're so, fixing. Yeah, that can happen. I would say, you know, with a rigid shifting tool that can happen, with a jig that can happen. Uh, you know, again, you want to be careful. You don't go max correction with a jig. Obviously, that there's a feel to it in terms of how much you try and twist the knob to get correction. But, you know, say you did fracture, right? Then what you, you, what you typically need is something that's thick enough to go all the way down the shaft beyond where you fracture. Because usually where you fracture, you don't usually fracture all the way down the shaft. It's usually, you know, very distal where, where you'll fracture because that's where all the tension is, right? You're not going to fracture beyond the tip of this spike here. Uh, but anyway, something that goes all the way down, say like a hemostat, like a curette, right? So that you can still then shift the head. It may be a little harder to get max shift, but it's definitely still very doable. But that's your bail if you fracture the medial cortex. You need something thick that goes all the way down the shaft. Do you ever, uh, I saw early on, they would use intramedullary K wires and just use that as their mode of fixing it. Is that a, is that a reasonable bailout? And if, if you can't get the, if something happens that you can't get the screws placed, say there's a fracture or something totally. like that. I mean, really anything, anything that's, it's, it's the same idea, right? I mean, it's something that you're putting all the way down the shaft, um, but absolutely you could do that. And then same goes like, so say, you know, we, the other thing too, you want to keep in mind when the surgeon is doing this is that we talk about the DMA, the distal metatarsal articular angle which is kind of the way the articular surface is, is facing, you know, we typically pull the hallux into varus. So that's going to, you know, make the articular surface angle also into varus slightly or can if you pull too hard. It's just one other thing you want to check when you're, when you're kind of looking at this correction. You want to make sure that it's angling the same way as the rest of the metatarsal heads in terms of the articular surface where the cartilage is. And if you don't, like if you can't quite get it set, another thing you can do is just put a K wire transversely right into the first metatarsal head. And this also uh, is, is uh, helpful for rotation as well. You can use it to derotate the head, supinate the head, uh, but you can put that in there and, and just gives you like a kind of third tool, right? To, or another tool, sorry, to, to help your alignment of the head if you need it, right? So there's never any harm in putting a K wire into the head itself to help get the correction you want. I think that capsule pulls a little bit too. That's, uh, you know, just the natural tendency of that head to want to rotate sometimes even without doing, doing as much rotational movement to it. It tends to correct that DMAA. Definitely, definitely. So this is super important. I can't, uh, this is like also just as a rep, I mean, this is where you definitely come in here. But so my rule of thumb is that if it's an, if it's an even measurement, I take four millimeters off. If it's an odd measurement, I take five millimeters off the measurement, right? And and your proximal wire, when you put the, the little uh, measuring guide down, it, it'll sit pretty flush on the bone, but the distal one usually sits a couple millimeters kind of away because it's hitting that more proximal cortex first. But this rule of thumb, really my screw removal rate is pretty dang low, probably around one to 2%. Uh, you know, this is what I, when I first started doing this, no one had it. Well, maybe two millimeters you take off, like no one kind of knew, but this has worked pretty well for me. And, and conversely, right, your screws, you want to have them within about two to four millimeters of the articular surface um, on the other end. But I would, you know, you just don't want the screw edge prominent because like I said, the patient's going to feel it. Now, let me see if I can advance this. There we go. Good. So in terms of drilling this, this is, it, it almost looks like the head is kind of invaginating over the uh, the osteotomy or sorry, the shaft here. And that's because this was a Chevron osteotomy. This was probably pretty early on in my experience. Uh, but when you over drill, you want to definitely drill into the capital fragment. I typically use threaded K wire for my proximal wire. It's threaded. So it's less likely to pull out when you do your over drill. Um, also, I try and keep the, the drill running because when you stop it and restart, it's more likely to kind of catch the wire and then it pulls the wire out right when you pull the drill out. I also irrigate the wire, irrigate the drill bit. Um, you know, again, my whole goal is to leave that in there, especially when you're a surgeon, when you're doing this first time, you know, with a surgeon and like they're kind of like they got that that wire just what they wanted it. You know, and then they pull the wire out. It's like, oh shit! You know, now I gotta, you know, now I gotta replace that by hand, try and get it back where I want it, right? So this is that's everything I do to kind of prevent prevent this from pulling out. Uh, I would also tell you, like for for young patients, you got to drill up to about four millimeters from the tip, 
you know, for uh, like an elderly patient with softer bones, you really just need to pop into the head. You don't need to go all the way close to the tip um, because those ones, the screw will easily be able to cut all the way to the tip. And the reason that's important is that, you know, when you're then putting your screw in, there'll be a lot of torque, a lot of force on the, on the screwdriver if they've got really good bone as you're doing your final turns. Right, and you can snap that tip of the, the screwdriver, you know, again, if they've got really good bone and your surgeon doesn't have that screwdriver fully seated in because you got to remember, you know, I'm, I'm screwing this in with my fingertips at the end because if you put your whole hand around it, it's going to kick the driver away from the ankle because of the medial soft tissue and kind of put you off access inside the screw head. And that can lead to it kind of breaking the tip off of the, the driver. And then your surgeon's pissed off because now they got to fish out the tip and, and, you know, they got to, it's just like an added, added portion of the case. These are all really, really, really good tips, by the way. I mean, all those little nuances, I think, can really keep you out of trouble because nothing's worse than a broken screwdriver, you know, in the tip of a screw. Yeah, I mean, there's no, be there's no better way to, like, have a surgeon do something never again than, you know, have something like that happen if they're not, if you're not kind of prepared for it and get them out of trouble quick. What do you, do you have a um, K-wire on the back table to help um, advance it? I mean, if, if you drill all the way to the tip, of the K wire. Yeah. Know. Yeah. So, so I, exactly. There's always three, three of the, I think it's a one six K wire up uh, on the Mayo for me for this, for that exact reason. That's exactly right there. And then, you know, when I started doing this, we didn't have a sleeve to put over the screw when you advance the screw and, and, and it's going at a steep angle. It really beats up the soft tissue uh, if you don't have a sleeve. And so we have a chamfered sleeve and I just run that screw in on power, which is so fast because these are like 60 millimeter screws. You really hate your surgeon if you make them put it in by hand, but you want a chamfered kind of screw insertion sleeve uh, to allow that that your their assistant to hold that down to the skin and prevent the screw threads from beating up the skin when you put it in. And that also allows us, like I said, to fire it in on power, uh, which makes it much faster. So we've done that. You got your screws in. Now we now they've got this big kind of spike at the end of the medial first metatarsal shaft. So the way we get that is we use the 2.2 by 22 millimeter burr. And I come in through my distal screw insertion incision. The other thing I didn't tell you guys is uh, earlier, but I, I only make my small little longitudinal incisions over my K wires once they've been placed and I like the position. I don't pre-make incisions. Uh, for for uh, my screw my screw incisions, just so you guys know, some people like will make one one incision up there along their line ahead of time. I all you need, I just make a small incision over the uh, guide wires once they're set. Um, but anyway, so I use the distal screw insertion incision to then put my burr plantar to this spike, and then I saw upward to to free up the spike, and I've got my thumb over the dorsomedial spike. So, and I'm kind of pushing down with my thumb on that spike. So I can feel it give way when I'm done. So that's step one, right? So, okay, great. So we cut that, that part's done. I've had, some people do like to go from their initial incision site where you do the distal osteotomy, they go retrograde. That's totally fine. But my preference is to go anagrade like this, like you can see here. So then we freed up the spike. Hey, Oliver. Yep. Well, why do you go from plantar to dorsal? Is it just because you can feel it as it comes through? Just because the nerve is dorsomedial. So now at this point, the nerve is gone with the head translated lateral. So it's probably pretty safe, but that's why. That's why. It really, I don't want to go anywhere near the dorsomedial sensory nerve branch. Got it. Uh, that, that's really the reason why. And again, this is a predominantly, this is more like a saw like translational maneuver with slight rotation upward uh, in order to get that spike. So you free it up with a big shift. I may need to slightly extend my incision to kind of five, six millimeters to get that whole spike out. And I typically pull it out with a synovial rongeur or a, a mosquito kind of small hemostat. Um, sometimes it comes out in two pieces. Joe Vernois would tell you, you can also just shove it into the osteotomy side as bone graft, but I'll typically remove it. Just, you know, this area I'm in mean, is so high demand and, and, uh, you know, I don't want them to feel like a little spike there in the event it kind of heals prominent. So I typically remove it through the distal incision. And at this point, so once this has been removed, you could come back now and take out the medial eminence if you want, but you can't get the medial eminence. So say you didn't do it at the beginning uh, or your surgeon wanted to wait and see. 
this is would be the time you can come back in and get it. And the other thing I see too is that, you know, sometimes, okay, you cut the spike, there might still be like a little sharp kind of portion of bone at that spike remaining, right? You can go in there. I just put a little ragnell in the incision right over top of it. And I come in with a little small rongeur, synovial rongeur, and just kind of make that smooth uh, just in case that's there and you feel it. That's just, I just feel right along there, see if I feel any sharp, sharp uh, points. All right, so we did that. Now we do our ache and osteotomy. You know, surgeon may say, do I need to do this? The reality is, so this technique, right, um, patients, and again, it's predominantly women, much higher risk of pelvic in women, you know, they have a bunion surgery. They typically don't want their, their first and second toes touching, right? Like they feel like they didn't have a bunion correction then, right? And so this, we do our ache and osteotomy, right, in order to make them not touch. It does give you a little better, you know, correction. Obviously, the toe looks a little straighter. And this is what kind of replaces uh, or, or uh, obviates the need to do a medial capsular imbrication like we've traditionally done uh, with open bunion procedures, right? Meaning tightening the capsule of the joint. And that's probably what generates a ton of pain for a patient is doing that capsular tightening and also stiffness. Uh, but again, aching osteotomy, I'm probably doing this 95, 98, probably 98% of the time. Uh, the only time I don't do it is if it's a more, you know, very mild bunion uh, or, you know, it looks like if I do it, I'm going to just throw that hallux into like kind of what looks like varus. Uh, it's just going to look abnormal. Uh, and the nice thing about this, so a couple things about the ache and, you know, you're, you're typically coming in retrograde, as you can see on the, on the left, I'm angling back toward the metaphyseal region of the bone. So the metaphysis is just beyond the joint and before you get to the shaft. Um, the reason that's important is that if you angle straight across at the level I'm showing here, you're going to be kind of more diaphyseal, and the the cortex is just going to crack on the far side when you try to close down the medial side, right? The, whereas if you go to the metaphyseal region, it'll kind of elastically deform without cracking on the lateral side, so it maintains the stability of the osteotomy. The nice thing is, I, I you know some surgeons the options are you can use a, a fully threaded constant pitch screw like I do, which is the Pika screw here, uh, or a surgeon might use like a compression screw. I like the Pika screw because I could, you know, maybe I, I do the ache and it's just too much correction, right? Like it looks, it looks kind of too varus now, you know, I can just maybe close it down a little less, right? And it's a fully threaded screw. So it's going to, it's going to hold the position, you know, maybe it's not fully closed down, but it's going to hold the position where I want. So that's why I like this constant pitch screw. Uh, and again, I think it provides a little more stability than a partially threaded headless screw. Uh, that's one point I would make. And say your surgeon does it, and he's like, you know, I just need more correction. This is a severe bunion, right? Like this is a huge bunion. You know, I, I just need some more correction clinically. Well, then you can, you, I do my two by 12 millimeter burr here, right, initially. But then I can come behind it with my three millimeter wedge burr to widen my Aiken osteotomy. And this is the same, you know, the, the way we do this, the same kind of as the distal first metatarsal osteotomy, but I do my dorsal cortex first uh, with the hallux IP joint extended to protect the EHL. Then I do my plantar cortex with the IP joint plantar flex to protect the FHL on the bottom to take tension off of them. <laughs> but that's the osteotomy. And as I mentioned before, I rarely do a uh, uh, lateral release. Uh, you know, if anything, I'm doing a lateral metatarsal sesamoid release for sesamoid rotation if I feel like they need it when I'm done. But again, it's pretty rare I'm doing any release these days. So, you know, again, this is, I, I used to use stereostrips predominantly, I think just for the sake of like these incisions can ooze because you cut the bone and you can't cauterize the bone. I typically just use a 3-0 monocro for the skin, but this is just kind of emphasizing the clinical side of it. Uh, and you know what it looks like when they're done. I typically just close the skin with a simple 3-0 monocryl for each of the little incisions. It used to be this elaborate bulky dressing. The reality is it doesn't matter. Um, you don't need to use a toe spacer for these patients unless I do a lateral release. <laughs> and it's just a simple bunion dressing for these patients. This stays on for two weeks or one to two weeks. You can take it off after that. They're in a Darko heel shoe for the first four weeks. And then a regular shoe. The reason I put them in the heel shoe is just because some patients, because they don't have a lot of pain with this, they just act like they didn't have. 
surgery. So that heel shoe is kind of awkward to walk in and it just protects the patient from themselves. That's why I like it. I start PT at four to five weeks. They can start exercise bike by two weeks as long as they push through the midfoot, not the forefoot. Uh, you know, walking for exercise at four weeks, elliptical at six weeks, and then running in heels at three months. Again, I always tell these people that six months of swelling, I tell your surgeon or I tell your surgeon to, to tell them that just because that just keeps you out of trouble at three months when they can't fit into their dress shoes. And this is just showing some, this is just two weeks out, you know, again, motion, they haven't had any PT yet. Um, and they really, they, they, they're much less stiff than when you do open bunion procedures, whether it's a lapidus or anything with a capsular imbrication. So when I first started kind of posting these cases on, on LinkedIn, trying to get exposure out there for the MIS techniques, you know, people would always say that's not going to heal. That's going to be a non-union, right? And the body is just so cool, right? So this is showing pre-op on the left, four weeks out on the, in the middle uh, radiograph here. And then on the right, you can see once it's remodeled the year out, you can see the body just forms this new bone all the way across. Everyone gets vitamin D for me, so I, you know, I, I think that could affect the body's ability to remodel if they have low vitamin D. Uh, and again, if they're on a bisphosphonate, uh, say especially like prolia, I try and have them hold it for six months after the procedure, at least three months, uh, just because it's such a strong inhibitor of the of uh, one of the cells that allows your body to remodel bone. Uh, but this is super cool, and it's basically your body realigning the bone or remodeling the bone it, it, uh, where there's stress. So that it does heal, I promise you. Um, and I'm certain to ask, yes, it does heal. I've uh, been doing this long enough to know uh, that we've kind of, you know, obviously as MIS has grown, you've kind of seen that validated with everyone else's experience. And so here's the end results a year later, and you can see very nice cosmetic appearance. This is an even more exaggerated kind of view of what remodeled bone looks like. Again, the screw placement could have been better in this top right image, but nonetheless, it got the job done in this case. Again, it just really shows like that metatarsal almost looks straight, right? It's super cool to see the the body's ability to remodel there. And then this is just, oh, there's a video here. I don't know if it'll play, but, uh, you know, again, just going, this is the year out. You know, normally we tell people after three to four months, they're not going to gain range of motion. But I, you know, with MIS, you, you can see them even gain range of motion after three months, uh, which is pretty cool. Hey, Oliver, there's a question here about the um, Aiken. Um, do you have any concerns with driving the K wires out through the inner space and then grasping it with the hemostat before drilling? No, so I think I think that's a great question because I do that routinely, right? So for that for the Aiken, I have no problem with that, right? I'm not throwing it out into a jo or out of a joint to then capture it with a hemostat. And the reason you know the reason we do that routinely is because again to avoid pulling the wire out. But no, I absolutely always send it out uh, for an Aiken. I you know, some surgeons will will send it out for the distal first metatarsal osteotomy. So they send it out the web space yep. and grab it with a hemostat to avoid pulling it out. But I'm kind of a purist. Like, I don't want to violate the the articular cartilage uh, if I don't have to. Uh, I think it'll just increase stiffness. Obviously, you know, could lead to, you know, early arthritis, right, whatever. Uh, but I don't do it for the distal first metatarsal osteotomy site, but I do it routinely uh, for the ache and osteotomy. If a surgeon wants to, because they don't care, that's totally fine. Uh, but again, for the ache and I do it routinely. Another question here, Oliver, we have, um, so uh, lapidus versus MIS, your post-op changes or adjustments that you've made um, and how do you compare them? I think you went over some of it, but if you could just kind of highlight the, the big changes. Yeah, so for MIS, uh, they they typically have much less pain. So I don't have to give them as much in terms of narcotics. Uh, they, they might take, I mean, sometimes they come in, they say they take no narcotics. That's a big difference. You know, when I'm doing lapidus and I'm using, you know, screws or even stapling screws, plate and screws, you know, I really think they have to be off of it for four to six weeks. You know, I just, and it's not so much that the first TNT joint you'll lose correction, but if they've also got intercaneiform instability and you're, you're trying to put screws across the intercaneiform joint, I mean, that will widen so fast with early weight bearing. You know, I don't care what Tree says, but they will, they, I promise you, will widen across the medial intercaneiform joint if you just put one screw or maybe even two screws across that, you know, without keeping them off. So, again, it typically takes longer before I can kind of mobilize them. Um, I'll typically put them in a short boot versus uh, just a post op shoe for a lot. So, short boot for a lapidus versus a post op shoe for a MIS procedure. 
Um, you know, and then again, in terms of stiffness, I think they're less stiff. So sometimes like 50, probably maybe actually 40% of the time, they'll just decline physical therapy because they're usually pretty good. Um, those are kind of the biggest differences I see between the two techniques. Great. So Thank how you. do you, how do you respond? I mean, it's, it, there is, it's a bit of a debate and, and people get pretty passionate about, you know, one versus the other, um, whether it's MIS or, or Lapidus you know, with the, the idea of the Lapidus going to the Cora. I mean, you've already shown some x-rays that, that show pretty amazing remodeling over time. Um, but, you know, like you said, there's never, we don't do, do things always the same time. And that's not a really good, good opinion to have, but, but what's your response to that, 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 that the people that are very much, Hey, the lapidus is the way to go. Well, so number one, you're, you're burning the first TMT joint, right? So you may have a first TMT joint where, you know, again, it's totally, again, anyone who's a lapidus delta is going to say, well, no, the abnormalities of the first TMT joint, you have to burn it. But the reality is you do that in adolescent, you are going to concentrate stress elsewhere. And, you know, what I've seen, there used to be a lot of lapidus done in our area. You know, we see a lot of people developing first TMT, not a lot, obviously nothing's a lot, but you see people developing first TMT arthritis, right? Like within a year after a lapidus. Um, so it does concentrate stress elsewhere. And obviously the younger the patient is, the longer term where that stress is going to be concentrated in the joints around it. Um, it, it's just a much longer, more painful recovery for patients, you know, and, and for say the 70 year old woman who, you know, is low demand, it's hard for her to keep weight off her foot. You know, it, it's just a much easier uh, procedure for someone to go through. Say it's the, you know, teacher who's trying to do it during spring break, right. And then she's got to be back on her feet, you know, in a week or two. Right. Again, it's a much easier procedure for the patient to go through. They don't hate me for doing MIS bunions to them. You do a lapidus bunion, they may not like you. Uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, again, that's that's really the that's really kind of how I and, and it's, not agree, it's more apparent when you start when you see these people coming in and you see what it looks like after an open lapidus and you see what it looks like after the MIS technique. But I, I tell I was telling Nick before the call, I mean, these are like we, we, we love brochures, like I said, because it's 95, 90 percent chance success, very predictable. And these feel like brochures coming in. They're not complaining about how awful it was in terms of pain. Um, one other question here, Oliver, if you have a person with a big hallux valgus angle, but no arthritic changes in the first TMT and no first MTP joint arthritis, but they have a hypermobile first ray. You recommending an MIS bunion or are you going towards a lapidus and something like that? Uh, so uh, I would, are you going to say also, there's also a big IM, IM, uh, uh, or sorry, a one, two IM angle, like an elevated one, two IM angle. Yeah. Let's say that. All day MIS. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but actually the, the tougher question is, is someone with metatarsal ductus, right? Yeah. And so. Metatarsal ductus, the problem is this, this correction, and even lapidus, right, which there's been some decent literature for lapidus for, for metatarsal ductus is a better option compared to, a, compared to a distal osteotomy. But, you know, this technique really relies on your IM correction. And so the problem with a metaductus, metatarsal ductus, where the second and third metatarsals are kind of angled toward the first metatarsal, uh, is that there's not a big IM space not a big elevated IM angle. And so they tend to have a high hallux valgus angle, meaning the big toe is, is pointed well away from the first metatarsal shaft, but there's not a lot of space to get correction between the first and second metatarsals. And so in those patients, what I, what I do is I do a, a MIS lateral closing wedge at the base of the second and third metatarsals to then increase my IM angle, right? Because now I've moved the metatarsal shafts over away from the first metatarsal shaft then i'll do my my pita technique right uh in order to do my mis correction that's what i'm doing obviously if you're like if you were a lapidus person you would do you know some kind of uh either metaductus closing wedge osteotomy to correct the metaductus and then and then do do a lapidus with that right but that's really the tougher situation that's what i've kind of learned i mean i've I've done this technique on people with metaductus and, you know, they've done well, but at the same time, like, you know, clinically they do well, but radiographically I look at it and I go, this is not my best correction I've ever had. And so what I've gone to doing then is doing that, you know, lateral closing wedge to address the adductus because now I've got an IM angle to correct through. And I think they've done much better with that. 
Well, we should probably wrap it up. We've uh, used a lot of your a lot of your time, yeah. Oliver. Really thank gonna... you for coming on. But yeah, hit these like these big take home points here because I think these are critical. This, this is one I just I'm going to end on this one point right here because you'll definitely get this. This will be like you know the patient's four weeks out or two weeks out, and you get this X ray, the top right X ray. Um, from your surgeon and go like is this okay is this normal like what the heck is this this is not how it looked when I was in the OR and so what you're seeing here in this top right image so I actually put this in to kind of show like you don't want to see plantar flexion of the osteotomy you see how it looks kind of plantar flex where at the distal osteotomy site but <laughs> what what you're actually seeing here is this patient is holding their first ray up off the ground right and so you're seeing this kind of supinated view so this this is probably actually totally fine because you're not getting the normal cascade view that you that you saw in the operating room because they're not putting full weight on the first ray. So this is probably fine, but the first response I would say is this this may be actually totally fine because it looks like they're holding their first ray elevated, which is giving you a false appearance of plantar flexion at the at the osteotomy site. That is that is one thing I think you may see, and then I'm just showing the bottom edge here. This is just you know, a burn from a wire, right? Emphasizing it's not just the burrs, but also the wires. So yeah. um, I'm, I think I just have, uh, th this is just someone who missed their, their, you know, missed the metatarsal entirely. And this is someone who just didn't take all the medial spike off at the end. You want to make sure you remove that. But this is just showing kind of a summary page of everything. You know, again, the, the learning curve is much shorter than it used to be. These concepts we now teach across the country routinely and I think even relatively ubiquitously among the different companies as well. I think everyone's kind of gotten on the same page, which is good. Uh, but, and again, I just haven't updated this, but it should be four to five millimeters off the screw measurement. Um, but again, MIS, like whether you, you know, don't have it in your area or not, it's definitely coming. And, you know, unfortunately, you're not or fortunate or unfortunately for whoever your surgeon is, but when someone starts doing it and gets good at it in an area, you know, it's a huge marketing tool you know, patients love MIS. If you can tell them, hey, look, I can do it with less pain and smaller incisions, any patient's going to go for it. As a surgeon, that's not just, that's not the only reason you should be doing something, but, you know, this sells super easily. And once one person starts doing it, then other patients start coming in, asking other surgeons for it, and it like just kind of snowballs. And so in our area it was myself and then another guy, you know, higher volume doing it. And now there's, like I said, about 30 surgeons where I am doing this. Yeah. So it, it's really for like a new surgeon in a market, it's really a great opportunity for them to get a kind of foothold in what might be an otherwise saturated market. And it's really a great way for them to differentiate themselves. Um, you know, I think I, what I see is when I go and teach this at fellowships across the country, you know, the the fellows are all super eager to do this because the rest of orthopedics has got MIS. I mean, like we're kind of, you know, fun part about foot and ankle in terms of industry is, is you know, we lag behind from a technology standpoint. And now there's all this growth and all this focus on foot and ankle as far as, a, you know, area of, of ortho to kind of, you know, make strides in. And so it's a super fun time to be in this. But you can see the fellows want to do MIS. The young surgeons out there are much more kind of open to doing this because they're not so set in their ways. Uh, but again, even the even the surgeons who are more mature in their practice, you know, they may hate forefoot because of what I've you know told you about before. And this is just kind of a way to give them a new option that's, you know, I think an easier recovery. Awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on. That was, uh, that was a great summary and a lot of really good tips and pearls that I think hopefully you can take away from and, and apply. Um, Jan, any thoughts? Yeah, that was, thing? that was fantastic. Thanks a lot, Oliver. Uh, learned a lot. So. <laughs> and I'll just put my uh, I'll just put my email here just in case any of the reps or anyone on the call wants to reach out. Um, that's my email right there. If you guys can still see it, uh, I'm always happy to answer questions and always happy to help out if a surgeon has a question. It doesn't necessarily need to be run through industry to you know get my time. I, you know, if it's a quick one off. I'm always happy to talk about it. Yeah, and I, and I think that's key. Like you said, just you know, if someone's new to this, ask someone who's done it a few times for tips and tricks. I think this is that's a really helpful. Uh, thing as well as doing it like you know you know going to a cadaver lab or uh, you know just playing with some of these new jigs before the OR um, not in the OR where it's something you know may drop on the floor people get frustrated or something I, I think it's very helpful to kind of run through a case um, when you know when it doesn't matter as much
All right. Well, we'll if there's any thoughts on the next, uh, the next topic, uh, reach out and uh, send some options. Otherwise, we'll, we'll pick some different things to go over. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Thanks, Oliver. Appreciate it. Thank you. See you. Bye.